Well, good morning. Great to have you with us today, live and in person, or live and online, or just online whenever you log into this. It is great to, uh, to have the chance to worship uh, with the people of God, and uh, we, we trust, we know that, that we're not going to invite God's presence here today because he's the one that invited us. He's already here. And so we, uh, we get to meet with him. We get to open the word of God together. We get to uh, express our love and gratitude and worship to him. Uh, these are times that uh, it would be really easy to be anxious, to be worried, to be afraid. Uh, it seems like every, every day or two we've got different things that, uh, that, that pop up and, uh, and it's just one thing after another. Philippians 4 gives us some instruction on that. If you would stand, let's listen to the word of the Lord as it calls us to worship today. It says, rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. 
and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. God has not given us a spirit of fear. We don't have to be afraid. When we're anxious, uh, when we're frustrated, it says in all circumstances we can rejoice because the Lord is near. Father God, we lift our, our lives, our hearts, our voices to you this morning. We thank you that you are near, that you are with us, that we can, uh, we can walk through whatever uh, life brings our way because we walk through it with you. Lord, we, uh, we ask that you would hear the, uh, the, the, the worship from our hearts this morning. In Jesus' name, amen.
be seated. Let's pray together. Father God, we confess to you that uh, so many times we are prone to wander. We are um, we're drawn away from, we allow ourselves to be drawn away from your truth, uh, your, your holiness. So Lord, we, we come to you and we offer ourselves to you today and we ask for your anointing, we ask for your forgiveness, for your cleansing. We thank you that you have promised to, to do just that, that when we confess our sin, you are faithful and just to forgive us and to purify us from all unrighteousness. And so, Lord, no matter uh, how, how uh, amazing that seems and maybe, uh, maybe impossible that seems, we pray, Lord, that you would, you would do what you've promised, that you would purify us from all unrighteousness that you would make us more and more and more and more like you, that we can represent you well in this world where we live. Lord, we, we thank you for the mission that you've given us to, uh, uh, to go and make disciples, to, uh, uh, to, to truly uh, love people to life, to, uh, to, to bring your presence with us wherever we go and allow you to, to impact the, uh, the, the people around us. And so, Lord, I pray that, that you would do that. We thank you for the opportunities that we've had, even this past week, to, uh, to speak up for you, to serve others in your name, uh, to make a difference, to bring influence uh, in people's lives. Lord, I pray that, that all of those things, all of those seeds that have been planted in people's lives would, would grow and flourish. And, and uh, because of the ministry that, that you are doing through the people of this church, Lord, I pray that people would come uh, to, to faith in you, that they could recognize and know your presence and uh, give their lives to you. Lord, we thank you. Uh, thank you for what you are doing through the ministries of this church. Lord, we, uh, we offer ourselves and our lives and our, our circumstances to you. Lord, we, it's so many things, whether it's the coronavirus or uh, the elections or um, other issues related to, uh, to so many things, uh, interpersonally, maybe even uh, uh, natural disasters and everything in between. Lord, it just seems so overwhelming. But Lord, I pray that even in these moments that we can once again recognize that you are our solid rock foundation that we can build our lives on. I pray that, that, that you, would, uh, you would help us to, to know that you don't change. Even when everything around is like shifting sand, that you are the solid rock that we can depend on. And so we put our, our trust and our hope in you. Lord, we pray that as we open your word today that you would speak to us. We pray that your spirit would be moving and active, that there wouldn't be anything that would detract from what you want to do uh, in our lives today. We open ourselves to you and we pray for your anointing, for your grace for your, uh, your peace, uh, for your instruction in our lives today. Lord, we thank you uh, in advance for who you are and what you are doing, what you're going to do in our midst today. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. I think it's time for our kids to literally take off, right? So... Have a great time, you guys, and while they're going, let me remind you about a couple of things. We are still, uh, as far as we know, still planning on uh, taking a meal to the Cleveland Victory Church, the people of their neighborhood, on the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Uh, that sign-up sheet is in the back, uh, still uh, working on the logistics of, of what that looks like. It is a takeout meal, not a sit-down, gather everybody around the table kind of thing. Um, so if you can participate either in, um, in bringing food or in volunteering, please let us know. The sign-up sheet is in the back, or if you're online, or if you are thinking about it sometime when you're not here, shoot an email to, uh, to me or to the church office uh, letting us know what you're going to bring and if uh, you are coming, planning on coming to, to volunteer. And again, if, if and when those things change due to uh, uh, government orders and all those types of things, then we'll let you know. Uh, but at this point, uh, we, uh, we are still planning on doing that. Also want you to know on that back table is something else pretty special and unique. It's been many, many years. We now have, a almost have, a new church directory. 
let me just tell you, some of you have aged a lot. No, I'm just kidding. I'm not going to, we're not going to go there. Uh, you notice it most in the kids, you know, because the last directory, I think Nick was like seven. So, no, I'm just kidding about that. It hasn't been that long. There is a rough draft back there, and we would love for you to take a look at it, and make sure that your information is correct, that we haven't uh, switched numbers around or mi- mixed up your email or whatever. We want to get that as, uh, as uh, you know, perfect as we can, knowing that as soon as we publish it, something new will happen and some of you will move just because you want to and you want to mess everything up but that's okay uh so that rough draft is right back there and we'd love for you to do that and then hopefully within uh the next couple of weeks uh we will have the the hard copy in your hands uh just one more thing as well you notice that we are kind of um mixing uh, holidays here. Uh, if you walked in, you saw the Christmas tree up in, out in the foyer already, and that is because we have a month to uh, to uh, purchase and uh, and and bring back gifts for Oasis of Hope, the families of Oasis of Hope, and those cards are on the tree. We've done this the last several years. Many of you have already seen you looking around and and uh, finding taking cards off of that so that you can purchase those gifts and. The instructions are there on the uh, on the wall next to the tree. As you uh, take those, we've got we, those need to be in by the middle of December, so you've got a few weeks to do that. But uh, want you to be aware of that, and that's why we've got pumpkins on the platform and a Christmas tree in the lobby. So uh, that we're 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 uh, we're getting ready. So so there we go. A um, whole lot of other stuff uh, coming as we as we can, and uh, again as uh, governors. Uh, instructions and all that changes over time we will keep you posted on everything uh and current but we're we're planning on continuing to meet in person and uh and moving forward although the christmas season uh may look a little different as we uh, as we shift some of uh some of those plans uh accordingly so uh stay stay tuned i guess is uh, is is what we need to do we have the privilege of um Worshiping as we give, and uh, we thank you again in advance for uh, for all that you are doing to support the ministries of this local church in a mon- bunch of ways. Those things are up there, and the uh, the receptacle is there in the back. If you uh, came ready to give this morning, that is is there for you as well. Uh, in just a minute, we have just uh, two more weeks left as we march through the book of James, and uh, and so in just a minute we'll be we'll be turning to James chapter four. But uh, let's uh, let's watch this first. Thankfulness can be hard to come by. Circumstances, brokenness, frustration, all getting away. It can be difficult to see God through the fog. You want to stand firm, knowing God is in control. But you look around and you see chaos. How do you give thanks in such a moment? truth is, life isn't easy. There's challenges. There's pain. There's heartache. Even though our landscape may change, we serve a God who never changes. When we're in our darkest moment, God promised to never leave us or forsake us. When our faith is shaken to its core, our God remains faithful. The world will ebb and flow, this is certain. But when we run with endurance the race set before us, and we fix our eyes on Jesus, we find thanksgiving. Just get some coffee. Just go up here to the coffee place and grab some. You're gonna leave without saying a word, no goodbye, no nothing. I love you, you know. 
too, no matter what, and you need to know that. Yeah, right. What do you mean by that? I don't mean anything by it. Yeah, what are you trying to say by doing that? I'm not trying to say anything. Sure you are. Forget about I mean, what is there to say? I've been cheating on you. You want details? Is that it? Details? Just slow down, please. Just go out and grab a cup of coffee. That's all you I'm You really asking. need to stop forgiving me like this, Jimmy. I'm leaving. Lisa. Lisa, please. No, here. Here's your ring. Would you please just take the ring? Come on, Lisa. After all those nights that I waited up for you, you can't give me the time it takes to drink a cup of coffee? Jimmy, please. Just a cup. No. A single cup of coffee, that's all I'm asking. What is it with you and the coffee? You make it sound like salvation or something. I don't want coffee. Would you please just take the ring? Why don't you just take it to a pawn shop and hawk it or something? I'm not taking it back. You know, Jimmy, it's not just the infidelity. Your birthday? I wasn't at work like I said I was. I was with somebody else. Somebody else? You know what I mean. That pocket watch I gave you? I didn't have time to go get your gift. So he gave it to me. That was his watch. Maybe you ought to give that back to him. Can't you see what I mean? I tried to be a good wife to you, I did. But there's something wrong with me, I can't do it. And you're a good man, Jimmy, you deserve better than that. I don't want better than that, I want my wife. No, you don't. Yes, I do. <laughs> no, you cannot love this. Nobody can care for this. stupid that I can't see that you're a walking contradiction and why can't I love you it's my heart it's my love I can do with it what I want I can love my mother I can love watching bees suck nectar from a flower and I can love your eyes when they're desperate and lonely like this. It's mine. I'm allowed. And right now, I invest my love in you because that is who I am. I'm your husband. I am the man who promised you through thick and thin. And if you could feel those words in the way that I mean them right now, you wouldn't question whether I'm capable of loving you or not. You would say no. He loves me that much. I'm only asking for a cup of coffee. James 4, beginning in verse 4 from the message, says this. You're cheating on God. If all you want is your own way, flirting with the world every chance you get, you'll end up enemies of God and his way. And do you suppose God doesn't care? The proverb has it that he's a fiercely jealous lover. And what he gives in love is far better than anything else you'll find. It's common knowledge that God goes against the willful proud. God gives grace to the willing humble. So let God work his will in you. Yell a loud no to the devil and watch him scamper. Say a quiet yes to God and he'll be there in no time. Quit dabbling in sin. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. Hit bottom. Cry your eyes out. The fun and games are over. Get serious. Really serious. Get down on your knees before the master. It's the only way that you'll get on your feet. I think most people in our society, probably most of you listening to this sermon here or online or wherever you are uh, hearing this, you'll probably agree that adultery is a pretty big deal. 
I mean, in a casual dating relationship, faithfulness is not really expected, right? But, but in marriage, it is. I mean, how many times could I have an affair this year and still be considered faithful to Rebecca? Ten times, maybe, right? No, five? One? Time for zero, right? The answer is zero. Uh, absolute faithfulness uh, has to be uh, where we're at. Uh, anything else is a breach of trust and it breaks the relationship. When you've made a commitment, when you've established a covenant with someone, and then you break that covenant, it, it causes a rift in the relationship, and it's a really big deal. And James says that God sees our sin as adultery. You're cheating on God, we just read. In the NIV, it says, you adulterous people. God isn't looking for someone to date. He wants a bride. (laughs) Uh, The church is described in the Bible as the bride of Christ. So if we're unfaithful to him, it breaks the relationship and it breaks his heart. If you have committed your life to following God and you've established a relationship with him and then you choose to ignore his leadership, you do your own thing, uh, you live like everyone else in the world is living, you, you please yourself first, you sin, then it's like you're cheating on him. Sin is a big deal, and we need to know that right up front. Sin is a big deal. So after James spends a couple of verses here in chapter 4, highlighting, circling, underlining that fact, uh, what a big deal it is to flirt with the world, uh, emphasizing that God is jealous for our affection, it would be natural for us, I think, to, uh, to, to kind of know where he's heading. I mean, it's all over. Adultery in marriage usually leads to separation and divorce. So uh, since sin is such a big deal and it's broken God's heart and it's like cheating on God, then it would be natural for us to assume that it causes a rift in our relationship uh, with him that cannot be undone. And yet that's where the plot turns, right? Because although sin is such a big deal, so is grace. The whole passage turns on verse 6. The NIV translation says, but he gives more grace. Grace. At the exact time when we would expect to see God's punishment and judgment, he gives more grace. It's, it, it's a major theme throughout scripture. Just a couple of uh, examples. Romans 5 verse 20 says, where sin increased, grace increased all the more. Psalm 103 verse 10 says that God does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. The only solution for sin, the only solution for spiritual adultery is the grace of God. Just as in a marriage, the only way to really restore the relationship uh, if if, uh, adultery has been committed is is for the wounded party to forgive and to take the one... uh, one take back the one who was at fault. It's grace extended by, by the one who, who was not guilty of, of an infraction. And, and now don't think for a minute, though, that, uh, that, that, you, that I want you to think that, that, that this grace diminishes the weightiness of sin. That's, that's not what James is talking about here. He, because we see up front, the first part, sin is a big deal. It's sin is, uh, is a big deal. It's like cheating on God. Uh, so grace doesn't diminish the weightiness of sin. Uh, we could read this and think that, okay, well, it's, go ahead, it's okay to go ahead and sin because God's just going to forgive us because there's this thing called grace out there and God has to forgive us, right? Uh, sometimes I, I think we live like we're asking the question, how much can I sin and God will still take me back? Try living in your marriage that way, right? It it doesn't work that way. The Apostle Paul addressed this head on in Romans 6. He says, uh, uh, verses 1 and 2, What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace can increase? And he says, by no means. In the old King James it says, God forbid. We are those who have died to sin. How could we live in it any longer? James doesn't diminish the gravity of sin here. In this passage, sin is a big deal. James is just emphasizing the depths of God's grace. Even in the face of adultery, he gives more grace. Now, I I know that you know what it's like to sin. Not in detail, I don't know your list of of things, but uh, scripture tells us, and uh, by experience, uh, I know that we've all 
sinned, right? Scripture says uh, that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We've all cheated on God. Uh, James says that that makes us God's enemy here in this passage. In in chapter 2 in in James, we saw that he encouraged us to be like Abraham, God's friend, but, uh, but, but that can't happen if we're flirting with the world. Sin not only breaks God's heart, it makes him angry because he's jealous when we sin. And and so it might feel hopeless, like like you're always going to be breaking God's heart uh, because you'll always sin. I mean, what what James is confronting here is is really nothing new. It's it's uh, part of of the human race ever since the the the, the first man and woman, Adam and Eve, in the garden uh, committed that sin, and we've inherited this this. Uh, this uh, inner sin that, uh, that draws us to commit sin. And, and so it just feels like, well, this is, this is just hopeless. Uh, God's people throughout history, uh, over and over again, if you read through uh, the Old Testament, you see that time and time and time again, they, they, they were adulterous in their relationship with God. He would restore them. He would move, in with, uh, move, move on their behalf, and, and they, would, uh, they would commit to following him, and that was fine for a little while, and then they would go and start worshiping other gods, and, and then he'd draw them back, and it was a big, and over and over, it's nothing new. It's, it's still difficult. And, I mean... We could also say, well, I'm kind of stuck in this and I have to, but also it's, it's kind of fun to flirt with the world sometimes, right? Uh, to follow our own desires. It, it feels, feels okay in the moment. And since it seems impossible to stop, why should I even try? Like the, like the woman in that video we saw a minute ago, you might think that it's useless to even talk to God about it. Because, I mean, it's just how I am. It's just, I'm, I'm not going to change. It's just going to happen. James says there's a better way. He says that we can live in a close relationship with God. He lays out some things that that, that you and I can do, how we can order our lives in order to remain faithful in our relationship with God, not breaking his heart time and time again. Uh, It wouldn't be possible without his grace, right? He gives more grace, uh, uh, but we are also then responsible to take action and to do certain things. And so there's a, there's a list there in the second half of that passage that we read, and, and we're going we're gonna to hit on, on those things here for a minute today. One big thing we need to realize, that giving in to temptation is not inevitable. You can resist. And that's the, that's the first big word there, the things that we, we are responsible for. Verse 7 says, resist the devil and he will flee from you. The way we read it before uh, in the message, yell a loud no to the devil and watch him scamper. C.S. Lewis, uh, in the introduction to his great little book, The Screw Tape Letters, says this. There are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about the devils. One is to disbelieve in their existence. The other is to believe and to feel an unhealthy uh, interest in them. Many people seem to have an excessive and unhealthy interest in the devils uh, as of late, books, movies, TV shows, whatever. We've we pretty much elevated the devil up there to be equal to or maybe in some senses even more strong, uh, than, stronger than, than God. We've got the, 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 the right and the wrong, the good and the bad, and, and they're kind of dueling it out, and sometimes the bad wins and sometimes the good wins. And, but but in, in doing that, then we, uh, we, we put the blame on the devil for our own evil choices. Sometimes we even cite that little excuse, the devil made me do it and I think in doing that we give him too much credit because we probably did it all on our own for the most the devil certainly is a force to be taken seriously but James says that all it takes to get rid of his influence is to resist him simply resist him push back say no the implication here is that James's audience that he's writing to was not resisting the devil and, and therefore they were facing all kinds of spiritual problems we could we could uh, you know we we spent a whole series on ephesians chapter 6 that talks about how we do this and the the armor of god that we put on in order to resist and stand strong stand firm as the devil comes against us but but bottom line first and foremost we've got to have the the decision that i'm going to resist and so many times we don't even go there oh it's just inevitable i'm just gonna just gonna give in too many of us we don't we just give in without a fight James says that if we fight, we can win. The devil will actually run away from you. Yeah, you're just that scary, right? The devil will run away from you, he says. But so many times we, I don't know, we flirt with, 
ah, it's not that big a deal, and we justify. And I, maybe you've heard the story about the hunter who went out to shoot a bear so he could have a winter coat. And sure enough, after a while, he saw a bear uh, coming toward him, and so he raised his gun, and he took aim, and he's about to, uh, uh, about to pull the t- trigger, and the bear said, wait, 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 hey, uh, why do you want to shoot me? And the hunter says, well, I'm cold, and I need a coat. And the bear says, but I'm hungry, and I need dinner. Can't we just talk about this for a minute? Maybe we can come to a compromise. So the hunter sat down beside the bear and began to talk over the pros and cons. And in the end, the the hunter was well enveloped by the bear's fur, and the bear had eaten his dinner. Oh, all right. When we flirt with evil, not saying no right away, we give room for the devil to work. And, and things don't end well. But if we resist the devil, James promises that he will flee. He will run away. We can resist. It is possible to resist. We, it is not inevitable that we will just give in to temptation and that we will sin, that we will break God's heart time and time and time again. We can resist the devil. That's our responsibility. God gives grace. He's ready and willing to forgive. We've got to resist the devil. We also... James says that we have to stop sinning. Quit dabbling in sin, verse 8. Purify your inner life. Quit playing the field. In order for our relationship with God to work, uh, you and I must repent and truly turn from our sin and obey God completely. It's not enough to just talk about it. You've got to do it. There's, there's always this, uh, been this running gag in, in the Peanuts comic strip that, with uh, Lucy and Charlie Brown. Uh, with the uh, with the football, there you see it up there, and you, you know you've you've seen that before. Um, they would play football together, kind of, right? She'd hold the ball, and then Charlie would run up, and right at the last second, she moves it out of the way, and he swings, and he falls flat flat on his back, and it's always some quick thing at the end and and uh, we'd see that pop up time and time and time again there there was one uh one point after that happened many times in the comic strip there's there's um there was one where where lucy was holding the ball charlie brown says no i'm not doing it i'm not i'm not gonna do it and lucy begs him and charlie brown says every time i try to kick the ball you take it away and i fall on my back and they go back and forth and finally lucy breaks down in tears and she says this Charlie Brown, I have been so terrible to you over the years, picking up the football like I have. I have played so many cruel tricks on you, but I've seen the error of my ways. I've seen the hurt look in your eyes when I've deceived you. I've been wrong, so wrong. Charlie, won't you give a poor penitent girl another chance? And Charlie Brown, in this comic strip, is moved by her display of grief And he says, of course, Lucy, I'll give you another chance. And he heads back to get his running start to kick the ball. And Lucy holds the ball. And Charlie Brown runs up. And just at the last second, as he's just ready to kick it, she pulls the ball away. And Charlie flies through the air and lands flat on his back. And Lucy's last words, standing over Charlie Brown, holding the football, she says this, recognizing your faults, And actually changing your ways are two different things, Charlie Brown. James says here that we've got to do both. Recognize our faults and change our ways. We're responsible for that. God gives grace. We're still responsible to resist the devil and to stop sinning, to change our ways. He's talking about sorrow for sin, brokenness. I mean, it's pretty dramatic here. He kind of gets in a, in a dark place, so to speak. Uh, he says in verse 9, grieve, mourn, and wail. Change your laughter and your joy to gloom. This isn't that we go around all depressed all the time, but in, in, in the sense that as we recognize the gravity of our sin and its effect on our relationship with God, that God considers this adulterous, that we're cheating on him, uh, that, that we recognize that this grieves God's heart and it should grieve our hearts as well. And we grieve until things are made right. And so he says, quit dabbling in sin. Purify your life. So resist. Stop sinning. But James' overarching theme here, in light of our sin and God's grace, is a posture of humility. He says to humble 
yourself. And, and that's kind of behind, uh, uh, in and around and behind all of this. Verse 6, God opposes the proud but shows favor to the humble. Verse 7, submit yourselves then to God. Verse 10, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will lift you up. It really comes down to the issue of who, who's in charge, who is in control. Am I in control of my life or I am, am I submitting to God's leadership and his control of my life? A woman uh, was rummaging through her purse to find her wallet at the checkout counter at the, to pay for her, uh, her purchases at the department store. And as she dug around in her purse, uh, the, the a TV remote fell out onto the counter. You know, the big direct TV thing fell right out on the counter. And the cashier kind of chuckled and said, do you always carry your TV remote to the mall? And she said, no, but my husband refused to come shopping with me today, so... control right that's that remote can remote is all about uh it's not only controlling the tv it's me controlling the tv one of my friends used to say that 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 it, it's usually the guy that, that wants the remote right and 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 we want the remote not so that we can see what's on tv but so that we can see what else is on tv right and we're always always clicking through it's not not all it's maybe in the, in the remote it's not just men it's it's all people humanity we want to be in control it's part of that sin nature james says that's a huge thing that has to change if we're going to live for god we've got to humble ourselves in the end there are, there are two kinds of people cs lewis says those who say to god thy will be done and those to whom god says thy will be done you will not stop sinning. You will not resist the devil. You will not truly access the grace of God until you humble yourself and give up control of your life to him. One, one theologian put it this way. Human pride is the one insurmountable gr- barrier to grace. Humility is, has been defined as standing in God's presence and knowing your brokenness and your inability to fix it. And so we come broken and humble to God. We, we come to the end of ourselves. We let go of control. We depend on God. We, we trust in him. We, we obey. We recognize we're not in charge anymore. God is in charge. James uses the word submit yourself to God. That, there's the connotation there of surrender. We, we don't usually think positively about surrender. Uh, the surrender, that's what losers do, right? Uh, oh, I give up. You, you, I give up. And so we think, well, that's, that's negative, but that's exactly where God wants us when he, we say, God, I give up. I can't do this anymore. I'm continually uh, getting drawn into sin. I'm continually uh, cheating on you. Uh, I give up. Humble. I humble myself. I submit myself to your authority. No more fighting against God. We have to surrender to him and what he wants for our lives. I I guess what James is saying here is is that you need to throw yourself on the grace of God and trust him to do what's best in your life. He gives more grace. So the grace is there. It's ready. How do we access that? Well, uh, we, well, yeah, we resist and, and we stop sinning, but ultimately we're submitting ourselves to his grace, to his authority. We throw ourselves on his God, do whatever, whatever you think is right. In light of our sin, in light of our cheating ways, We don't deserve grace, but God is offering it. So if we resist the devil, if we turn from our sin, if we humble ourselves, he gives more grace. Maybe verse 8 gives us a glimpse of uh, of what happens, what the, the picture of what this looks like when we do this. It says, when we come near to God, God will come near to us. Draw near to God and he will draw near to you. It's a picture of relationship restored, right? Uh, Although we've cheated on God, he gives us the possibility of a restored relationship. Uh, You need to know that you are as close to God as you want to be. It's not that he's holding himself back. (laughs) He is ready. He's all in. He's ready to, to, to move in, but he's waiting on us to humble ourselves, to submit to him. The decision is ours. If we draw near to God, he's ready and willing to draw near to us. Many people say that that they long for a close, intimate relationship with God, but they're not doing what it takes. They're not taking the time and putting in the effort to do what it takes to draw near to him. We fly so fast through life. We don't make God a priority. 
we miss him all together. We, we become rather friendly with the world, right? We, do, we don't hardly realize the, the, the toll it's taking on our relationship with God. We don't recognize our sin, our adulterous ways. We get further and further away from God. But sin, sin is a big deal, James says. Thankfully, so is grace. So because of his grace and forgiveness, when you humble yourself and you draw near to him, he is ready and willing to draw near to you to restore the relationship that had been broken because of your unfaithfulness. I don't, I don't know what, uh, what you might be struggling with today in light of a sermon based on uh, cheating on God. Um, I've got to give you the chance to, uh, to, 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 to talk to God about that. Our worship team's going to come back up here in just a second, and they're going to play a, uh, a great new song for us that's, uh, that's going to serve as our invitation today. And, um, and so as they, uh, as they do that, we have to evaluate what, what is God saying to us. Maybe there are specific things the Holy Spirit has pointed out in, in your life today, and, and, and maybe some repentance is needed. Or maybe you realize, I don't know what specifically, or maybe there's some, but, but I've just been drifting. I just feel distant. Uh, I haven't really recognized the toll that that's been taking on my relationship with God. I need, to, I need to draw near to him, knowing that he's going to draw near to me. So, I mean, this, this could, be, could be a big moment for you. Sin is a big deal. So is grace. Resist the devil, say no to sin, humbly throw yourself on the mercy and the grace of God. Surrender, draw near to him. He wants to draw near to you. you stand with me and let's pray and then we'll sing this song. Father God, what a, what a wonderful truth to know that you, you give more grace. Lord, I pray that all across this room and through the, through the internet and whoever might be watching this whenever they are, Lord, I, I just pray that you would, you would speak your truth through your word. If there, are, there is something or, or several things that are keeping us from drawing near to you, Lord, I pray that, that you would put your finger on those things in our lives and we would repent. Pray that you'll help us to resist the devil and the temptations in our lives, that you'll help us to, to stop sinning, to purify ourselves so that you can move in. And Lord, we just submit to, to you. We surrender ourselves to you today. Whatever you want to do in our lives, we ask that you would do it today. In Jesus' name, amen. As we sing, if you want to come and pray, you're more than welcome to do that. Uh, more than anything else, allow the Holy Spirit to move in your life. Let's sing together. Where I lay it down, every burden, every crown. This is my surrender. This is my surrender. Here is where I lay it down, every lie and every doubt. This is my surrender.
Father God, we surrender to you today. We thank you for your word and for uh, where it uh, points out the things in our lives that may need to change. We thank you most of all today for your grace and how you keep giving more. Lord, I pray that you would, you would bring your presence and your power uh, in our lives today. Purify us, strengthen us, embolden us. Lord, I pray that as we go from here, we would go uh, knowing that you go with us. We would go knowing that, that, that we uh, have, have met with you and, and you are continuing to mold us and shape us and change us and make us more like you. I pray that, that as we encounter uh, the people that you bring across our path this week, that, uh, that, that you would help us to, to say what needs to be said or, or maybe to keep quiet on something that we're tempted to say or, or that, that you'll help us to serve as you would serve. Lord, I pray that you'll help us to represent you well, that we can love the people to life uh, in our, uh, the people in our world this week. Lord, we thank you and we praise you and we, uh, we thank you for the, the opportunity that we've had to meet with you today. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. Oh. Oh, okay, yes, we've got a little business to take care of. Go ahead. Sorry, stick around if you want for a second. Hang on, hang on. I just need you online. I really just want okay. to. Um, last Sunday, November 8th, the Medina Church and the Nazarene Board, Pastor Pete and District Superintendent Wendell Brown spent some time together reviewing the ministries of the church and the church board and the pastor. This review is in accordance with procedures in the Church of the Nazarene centered around the anniversary date of our pastor's ministry to us. In our meeting, we, be, we reviewed the ministry areas of our church, noting the areas that, we are work, that are working well and noting areas where we need to improve. We believe that we are a great church and that God has wonderful plans to use us so that people find salvation in our community. We, the church board, strongly support Pastor Pete as our pastor and leader, by vote of the church board, we have extended a four-year call to our pastor, and he has happily accepted. In the, yay. So in the days that lie ahead, we want him to feel our prayerful support as he continues as our pastor for as long as the Lord leads. We're stuck together. Is that what you're saying? For a little while anyway, right? It is, uh, it is a privilege, again, to work with you to further the kingdom of God. And so that's what we're going to do this week. Head out and do it. We'll see you later.